a second. Public? Yep. Live. Okay. Says we're live. Sorry, we're a little bit late. We had a, a, a delay on Clark Road. There was a red light and somebody was delayed because of it. Um, I won't say who. Um, okay, yeah, let's see here. Today is, uh, I'm not going to read this because we've missed five Can minutes I, of class. Um, this here? What I will, uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, Psalm 119, uh, verse 57. Have, outside, divide, have, uh, tent wall. You are my portion, O Lord. I have promised to obey your words. I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your law. At midnight I rise and give thanks for your righteous laws. I am a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. The earth is filled with your love, O oh Lord. Teach me your decrees. Amen to that. Okay, so we'll skip this thing, Christian history, but I will say uh, we got, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll mention this again on Sunday. Uh, we had that Jesus film meeting on the 10th. We're a little bit late reporting it because I couldn't print anything off. But um, I, I will say 40 people attended, eight people came to Jesus. He uh, passed out the MP3s and Bibles people helped with. They gave food to the poor families. Uh, let's see here. Um, children's meeting, Bible study for new believers, and then they had some prayer requests. I'll read those on Sunday. And um, he attached pictures. If anybody wants to see those, email me and I'll forward them to you. And then he also sent this lady whose eyes, she was going blind. She needed three series of injections in her eyes. And uh, she wrote us a letter. First of all, I'm feeling God's greatest love and his guidance that he healed both my eyes. They're recovered. God answered my prayers and he helped through your efforts and prayers. I would like to thank you for your prayers and such a help to bless me. I'm very thankful to God for his help and healing. My eyes are saved, so now I'm able to work well. This was the third time I got the injection and I'm feeling comfort. Now I'm very happy and filled with joy. I am sending my recent photo and the doctor is recommended to wear glasses. So she got a pair of glasses, there she is. Her eyes are good, so praise the Lord for that. Thank everybody that helped with uh, her eye uh, stuff and uh, helped with the Jesus film meeting this month. And I better not put that away or I'll lose it. Um, and uh, let's see here, we are in 1 Timothy 5 and we're gonna start in verse 22 today. We are, start of the Wherever you Thank want. You. Let's just go back to the beginning of the paragraph, which is I, uh, uh, 21. I charge you in the sight of God, in Christ Jesus, in the elect angels, to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. 22. <clears throat> do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Okay, this one's similar. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the chance to come into your presence and to just share in your word. And uh, wow, what a delight. You gave us cool weather this morning, just right on time. The middle of October is uh, when we often expect it. And sure enough, it was so cool and nice. And it was a good day to work and get things accomplished. So we're appreciative of that. And uh, Lord, we got lots of people doing very dangerous jobs around Sarasota and around Florida and even around the U.S. still with all of the uh, calamities. And so we would pray for the linemen that are uh, getting people's power on and uh, the other emergency workers who are doing their job to get people uh, back into normalcy of life. How great it is to see how we can come together as a people and it would be even nicer if we would do it in the name of Jesus. But until that day, we're just thankful to you for the blessings of this life and for all you've done for us. Thank you, how good you are to us, and we just pray for this class and that the, what is said would be appropriate. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, um, so I, uh, I got an email from my mom today, said she wanted to borrow my chainsaw. <laughs> that ain't gonna happen, okay? I will do whatever needs to be cut. She ain't touching that chainsaw. I could just see her cutting off, you know, zoom right through her head or something. Sorry, no chainsaw for you. Um, uh, okay, here we go, 522. This is about don't lay on the hands and etc. 
Um, various ideas have been given about what do not lay hands on hastily means. I'm not supposed to, it, is it speaking of ordination? Is it speaking of healing? And, you know, all kinds of things. Some equate this with the laying on of hands for healing. Well, that would obviously not be the case because this is a pastoral epistle and we're dealing with the ordination of people. It goes back to what Paul said about uh, laying on his hands, the elders or the people laying on the hands of Timothy. Has to be it. But anyway, others say it is concerning the absolution of sins. Neither of these fit the tenor of what Paul has been referring to in the pastoral epistles, which is pastoral epistles. They're dealing with the church hierarchy. They're dealing with the people in the church that are electing leaders, appointing leaders, ordaining leaders, and so forth. So, um, rather, it is quite clearly referring to the ordination of others into the ministry. The laying on of hands for Timothy was referred to in verse 414 and in 2 Timothy 1 verse 6. The laying on of hands for special ministry purposes is mentioned also in Acts 6, 6 and 13, 3. So there's all kinds of places where laying on of hands for or, ordaining people for certain things is recorded. And it would make no sense to say, do not lay hands on somebody hastily if you're there to heal them. Why would you delay praying for healing over somebody? And the same thing is true with the absolution of sins. Laying on of the hands has nothing to do with it there. I mean, that's that's between the person and Jesus. And I, I don't know if any instance in the Bible where a person has his hands laid on for the absolution of sins. But that's, you know, that's what people submit these type of things. And I'm just tired enough where I could be wrong on that last statement because it's just been a long couple of weeks. But uh, anyway, the laying on of hands in this way does not impart to the individual some type of power that he had not previously possessed. Uh, a lot of people treat ordination as if you're somehow making a person a super spiritual leader that now has a power that other people don't have. I don't subscribe to that. The Bible does not teach it. And I just think it's an irresponsible way of uh, presenting your uh, idea about ord ordination of leaders in a church, okay? It does not give more of the spirit to the individual either. Um, one of the things that we bring up, and I bring it up as often as possible, and today is one of those times where the subject comes to mind, is that when you believe in Jesus, okay, you are a non-believer and you receive Jesus and now you believe in Jesus, how much of the spirit do you get? All, all. You get all of the spirit that you will ever get. The moment that you believe in Jesus, you now have the spirit. He has now sealed you for redemption. You will never get more spiritual wool in regard to receiving more of the spirit for anything you do, ever. And the good example that uh, everybody understands is that I am married to Hedico. She will never get more married to Charlie Garrett than the day that we said I do. It was done. I am now her husband. But she can get more of me and I can get more of her as we yield to one another. In the Bible, receiving the power of the Spirit is always passive. It is not active. I am a cup and I cannot fill myself but a cup is filled from externally. And how do you externally fill the cup? You do it through worship, through praise, through studying the word, fellowshipping with Christians, praising God. Those are things that will allow the spirit to get more of you. And therefore you are more in tune with the spirit, but you will never get more of the spirit than the moment that you receive Jesus. That is a false doctrine. It is taught by most Pentecostal and charismatic churches. Other churches teach it as well. It is false, and you know that simply because of the passive nature of the verb that is used when Paul or anybody speaks of receiving the Spirit, okay? It's done. You, the Spirit is in its fullness with you, and now the Spirit can get more of you as you yield to Him, okay? So, doctor is right, 100%. You have all of the Spirit that you will ever get the moment you are believed. So a person that is ordained for ministry doesn't get more spiritual. He doesn't get more of the spirit. He is not an elevated person in the sense of, uh, you know, it, it, we can elevate a person, you know, like a, a, a boss in a company. And we can say, he is my boss. I am going to give him extra respect because of that. That's fine. And that's 
what Paul would call double honor for a pastor or preacher or whatever. There's no problem with that. But as far as, you know, idolizing people or, uh, you know, the, the things that churches often devolve into over pastors, uh, and that becomes a real problem because just like movie stars who suddenly think that they're the greatest thing in the world because they're making millions of dollars and they have all kinds of fans and everything, they're just people. And they're as messed up as they can be. How many divorces do the people that you follow go through in their lifetime? Three, four, ten, right? How many times do you hear that they got a DWI or that their children have died of drugs? Okay, the same thing is true with pastors. The more you elevate some people, the more they are going to uh, think highly of themselves to the point where it is no longer healthy in their lives. Some people remain humble forever. You know, I, I don't know him personally. I mentioned Chuck Swindoll. I think it was last Sunday. Maybe it was two Sundays ago. Anyway, Chuck Swindoll retired at, was it 91 or 92 years old? He's going to preach his last sermon. I think it was actually last Sunday he preached it. I'm tired and I can't remember all the details right now. But um, Chuck Swindoll, at least through his demeanor, I don't know him personally. I don't know anything about how he led his life. For all I know, he leaves church in a Maserati. But from his demeanor as a preacher, he remained very humble. He never was one of these people that walked around on the stage and acted you know, goofy and, and gave up aura or a presentation that he was somehow elevated above the people. Um, I was going down the road. You know, I have a new car. I'm not used to it, and I don't have a Bible app, and it doesn't have a CD player, so I can't play my Bible, and I miss that a lot. It's been a week of missing the Bible, but I was going through the radio stations looking for something to listen to a value, and I pushed 104.3, and that's a Christian radio station, and the sermon that I was listening to was so cheesy, I actually turned it off, and that's not something I would normally do. I say, oh, there's somebody preaching, and you know, I'll listen to it. It was just terrible. It was just one of these motivational things where I love to give the analogy that if you just took out the name God and just said, you know, uh, the company name, it would be exactly the same thing. It would be listening to a motivational speech from a company. And that broke my heart because, you know, when I, I'm looking for something to listen to and I hear, there's a sermon, I'll stop and listen to that. And it, it had no value at all. It was completely valueless in what it was presenting because it wasn't speaking about the word. It was speaking about how you can be enabled. You can do it. It was what, like I said, it was just a motivational sermon by inserting the name God. That's, that's all it was. And so that, that breaks my heart. And I really like to get back to the Bible. I understand that uh, Bluetooth, I can download a Bible and somehow connect it in there and play that. And once I figured that out after we're all resettled in life, that's all I have on in the Bible, in the car again, is the Bible. I, I miss it. I mean, I just drive down the road and I'm listening to songs that I grew up with in high school, and it's kind of nice, but it's just not the Bible. Anyway, um, so the Spirit, you have it. You're not elevating a person through ordination. You are saying this person is acceptable for the ministry. We are putting our hope and our confidence in this person for whatever job he is being given whether it's just ordaining them for you know, future use, for you know, uh, baptizing people, for allowing them to marry people, uh, if it's ordaining them to be a children's pastor or a marriage pastor. Some churches have billions of people and you need to have a separate marriage pastor, um, uh, which kind of makes it impersonal, doesn't it? You got a, a guy in a church and that's all he does is he's like got a uh, assembly line of, of marriages. Okay, next. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it just seems so uh, odd, but you know, I understand there's a need when you got a church that's got lots and lots of people. But um, uh, anyway, um, uh, yeah, it is not a type of a talisman as well. When you put your hands on somebody and you ordain them, it is not a talisman, as some churches seem to infer. If you go to uh, the web and you watch the ordination of, say, cardinals in the Vatican, it's like they're ordaining them to some super secret office and they all wear these robes and it's it's like a well a, a talisman is a good word it's like this this thing that they're doing that changes them somehow they're just the same corrupt people they were before right 
Most of them were pedophiles. I, we learned this again and again and again from the Catholic Church. You got a cardinal, you assign him over a district, we'll say Philadelphia. And five years later, Philadelphia has a scandal and there's 600 children that were violated. There's uh, women who were violated even though they were married within the church and so forth. And it all comes right back to the cardinal and he's been allowing it. And then they're just corrupt people. These ordinations do not change the human heart, okay? But that's what churches kind of make it out to, and that's not the intent. The intent of it is saying that we recognize this person is suitable for the ministry. And that means they had to do their due diligence as well, because the Vatican is obviously not doing their due diligence when they, or actually maybe they approve of the things that they're ordaining. Uh, we're going to see that on Sunday unless the article changes. I've got an article about the ordination of a cardinal that I mentioned five or six months ago, and yes, they're going to ordain him, or maybe they already have. Anyway, um, and this person shouldn't even be in any ministry anywhere in the world. Okay, but there you go. This is uh, things that churches do or teach or believe about ordination, laying on of hands. Um, uh, if it's a talisman, they think that they're giving them apostolic authority, okay, which has been passed down from generation to generation. The Episcopal Church holds that, okay? The Catholic Church claims that they, the Pope sits in the seat of Christ. Peter, actually. Peter was the, the you know, the leader of the church, and he sits in. Now, uh, yes, the uh, Pope symbolizes, according to the Catholic Church, the mediator on earth. He is Christ, in, uh, uh, he is the example of Christ on in the church. But the seat that he sits in is called Peter's seat, okay? And so they believe that there's been an unbroken succession of popes since Peter, which is just proved right in the Bible, much less history itself. It's not even close to true. But Catholics will believe pretty much anything that the church tells them and it takes a lot of training of a person, I'm talking about proper training, to get them to understand that's incorrect. The Episcopal Church, you know, deviated from that. They don't have the Pope and they don't have the saints, but they have the unbroken apostolic line of succession. And they claim this. We are the ones that continue the apostolic line. The apostolic line ended with who? John. John, Revelation 22, verse 21. That was it. There's no more apostle uh, uh, of the church. There is no more uh, reception of the word from God in the church. There are people that now evaluate the word of God that has been received. Okay, so that's nonsense. And furthermore, if they are ordaining uh, the Episcopal Church, which is based upon the Church of England, which was, you know, they go back in their, their successions. But if that's true, they've done a very poor job of it. Right now, they're ordaining homosexuals as bishops. They're ordaining women as pastors and preachers and uh, even, uh, you know, lesbians as, um, what do you call it, bishops. It's just not true. And it does nothing. These laying on of hands and these things are just simply like being in kindergarten and getting a merit badge or a you know, piece of paper that says, I did this great thing. That's all it is. It, it has no bearing and no relevancy in Christ. Okay, each of these that I just mentioned and others are unscriptural. They're without any basis at all. There's nothing in scripture that justifies any of the things I just talked about, except what was conjured up from the heads of those who want to appear more spiritual than others. And all over the world, there are people that just want to be more spiritual than others. And it's not a scriptural way of handling things at all. Okay, when Paul met the people that he met, he was always humble before them. He wasn't super religious over them. Um, now, you could take an exception in the, uh, his second letter to the Corinthians where he says, when I come to you, shall I come to you, you know, uh, and I don't remember exactly how he says it, but we'll just say he could come to a meek or he could come to them with a, a fist of, uh, you know, a hard fist of uh, um, correction. That's not what he says, but I'm just saying that's kind of the, the idea. And he had that authority. As an apostle, he had the authority to call people out and to do these things. But he didn't use that in the sense that I'm better than you, I'm before you, or any of those things. He was an example to them by working with his own hands, with his own, uh, uh, you know, direction 
uh, from the Lord to make sure that he was uh, building up proper people within the church, proper doctrine, proper theology, and proper leaders such as Timothy. Okay, the laying on of the hands is simply a formal pronouncement. It is a solemn act which acknowledges that a person is to be set apart for the glory of the Lord. Okay, now they did that for the, um, a really good example of what I'm talking about is uh, found in the book of Exodus and Numbers and um, Le Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You know, you've got the Aaronic priesthood. Okay, and Aaron and his uh, four sons were ordained as priests, right? Everybody remember that? They were ordained. They had to stay in the tabernacle for a certain number of days. They had to eat certain food. They couldn't go outside. They had this long ordination process. Moses personally clothed them, put on their garments, and everything was very formal. Everything was very set. Okay, um, after they were ordained, or still at the time of the ordination process, what happened in Leviticus chapter 10? Improper incense. Yeah, they, they went in improperly before the Lord, two of his sons, uh, Nadab and Nabihu. And uh, they went before the Lord, they brought it in, and they were killed before the Lord. And that tells you right there. I mean, if anybody should have been super spiritual within the community of Israel, it would be the priests that are being ordained right there. And the idea was that they were be, to be holy to the Lord. Okay, as a matter of fact, Aaron's headpiece says, Kadosh le Yehovah, holiness to the Lord, right? And that was the idea, is that he's the high priest, and then his sons are ministering priests with him. And two of them walked in there, and they were not in a proper conduct before the Lord, and he killed them, okay? It just shows you, you're not suddenly a different person, and even though that's a completely different economy, it's a completely different um, covenant, etc., it shows you that what happens to a person is not something. Now, people could argue Saul. I mean, Saul, it says God will give you a new heart, and when you come here, you're going to start prophesying and blah, blah, blah. And that was a temporary thing, and there's a reason why that happened. Saul did not remain in that state, obviously. He turned away from the Lord. He turned away from uh, being a sound king. He went after King David out, out of jealousy. And so... It, and the whole point of this is it doesn't matter who you are as a human being. Your heart will direct who you are. And if your heart is not right with the Lord, you are not going to be right with the Lord. Okay? So um, that's the way it is. That's the way it was. And that's the way that uh, it is in the church right now as well. So it's a formal pronouncement. It is a solemn act. This person is being set apart for the glory of the Lord just like Nadab and Abihu. It doesn't mean they live that way, okay? Every day I read something on the internet, something of some church, some denomination, some pastor, some associate pastor that is doing something that is not appropriate. I read it every single day. There's never a day that it doesn't happen. And these people were ordained, okay? So don't elevate people based on a ritual. A ritual. Very good. Don't do that. Okay. Like baptism, it is a sign intended to relay a truth to the world of a certain already existing state of things. This is why Paul then says, nor share in other people's sins. Okay. He's tying the two thoughts together. Don't lay hands on people hastily, nor share in other people's sins. All right. If laying on laying hands on another for ordination injected that person with a super concentrated spirit juice, and I say spirit with a capital S, there would be no need for Paul to include the one ordaining in a warning about the laying on of hands. Okay, now think it through. The person that is being ordained is having hands laid on him, right? That means that the people who are, who are doing the ordaining are supposedly above the person who's being ordained, right? So if the person who is being ordained is being ordained by these people, and you're going to say, well, now these people here that are being ordained are going to be super spiritual, which the Bible doesn't teach. I'm just giving this as a hypothetical. Then that means that the people that are laying the hands on that person should already be super spiritual. They shouldn't have anything that is uh, 
hindering their walk with the Lord. And yet, Paul says, nor share in other people's sins. Telling you that they're just like you and me, okay? They have just been appointed to a position that allows them to now judge who should be ordained and who shouldn't be ordained. And, you know, there are churches I've been in where uh, selecting people for certain jobs is basically the old boys network, okay? This guy is, uh, he's a player, and so we're just going to have him. And he might not know anything about the Bible. He might not be scripturally sound, but he's a good old boy in the church, and so we're going to put him in a position. I've been in churches like that. So uh, you, you need to watch who you're ordaining. You need to stick to the Bible on it and stick only to the Bible, okay, and in the proper context, because we've already seen that people are doing things that aren't in the proper context in the in the Vatican, in the Episcopal Church, in the Methodist Church, and we could go down the line of all the big denominations. They are falling away or have fallen away from what is right. Um, the Southern Baptist Convention is still towing the line for the most part, but they've made a lot of really big mistakes in the past, okay? We've seen sex scandals that have been hidden, and obviously the reason why they do that is not I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, I would not think that it is simply like the Catholic Church to allow somebody to continue on because he's a part of the network, but because they don't want to get sued. And so, you know, once you admit that you've got a problem, now the entire denomination can be sued. And so they're doing it for the wrong reason, but it's not the same wrong reason as, say, the Catholic Church. Okay. Anyway, um, uh, but, you know, they, they appear at this point to try to be making right decisions. Uh, every time they have their uh, annual convention, you find out more one way or another. But uh, they did get rid of some bad churches in the past year. They've uh, cut off some people that are making bad decisions within churches, etc. So they're trying, it seems. And I, I hate to say that because tomorrow we're gonna have some big scandal. I'll say, well, Charlie just talked about that yesterday and they seem to be doing okay. You know, all you can do is look at the largest <clears throat> denomination in America, like with a microscope. You can't look at it with a telescope because there's so much going on in the Southern Baptist Convention. You can't see all, all the things that are going on, but you can look at a little part of it and say, well, that seems to be going okay. Anyway, um, let's see here. Laying on of hands of someone who is not fully qualified and whose sins are evident the one ordaining actually shares in the sin of the one who is ordained. That's the point that Paul is making. Don't share in the sins of others. You take somebody who should not be ordained and you ordain them, as we'll see on Sunday with the Catholic Church, you are now participating in the sins of that person. Ordaining him is not going to change who he is. It's not going to change his conduct. We see that in all parts of the world at all times. You get, what is it called, the Peter Principle, where somebody is being promoted and they finally get to the point where they're no longer, yes. uh, you know, they, they what, what, what's that? I think that's what that is. Okay, is yeah, and the then they... the point of complete inefficiency. If complete inefficiency. You, you promote somebody to the point where they no longer are capable of doing the job. So we see that in the business world. And then we see in um, uh, government... What's that? Presidency. Oh, well, I was going to get there in a minute, but uh, in, in the government, we have somebody that is a congressman, and he's, we'll just say, doing his job. He, he's not doing anything great. But now they appoint him to a committee, and the committee in the Congress is supposed to be ways and means, like the most powerful committee in the, the U.S. government. Okay, And we say, well, we, he's a good guy, and so we're going to put him in the Ways and Means Committee. And then he starts abusing his authority in the Ways and Means Committee. He starts enriching himself, okay? So we see it there. We see it with the presidency, okay? You get somebody that is wholly unqualified, but that person can be manipulated. And so we're going to put that person into this position so that we can manipulate that person to make decisions. All of these things, whether it's private or whether it's government or it is church, it doesn't make any difference. The people will not change once they are put into a position of authority. They're going to double down in their sins, okay? They're not going to change. If a person is doing something uh, perverse, I'm talking about, you know, we'll just say the, you know, guys and guys. You're there to, and you say, well, if we promote you, will you give this up? 
oh yeah, I'll do that. That will never happen. Okay, it's not going to happen. So, uh, and you shouldn't be ordaining somebody like that anyway. The Bible stands against it, but it's just an example. We want to help this person. We want to help them get out of the life they're in, and this will help. It will not, okay? Unless somebody is already qualified, that person should not be ordained. Okay, if laying on hands of, of another for ordination, uh, yeah, I read that. Um, okay, as he works in the ministry, sinning and performing in an unrighteous manner, the person who ordained him bears the responsibility for his actions in allowing the miscreant into the ministry in the first place. And what, like I said, we'll see that on Sunday. Uh, the Pope has selected one of his cardinals. He's selected a lot of them, but one is so wholly unqualified, he would not be qualified to even be allowed to sit in this church. Wouldn't even be, if I knew who the person was and he came in, I'd say, I'm sorry, you cannot sit in this church. You have to leave because that's how bad of a person he is. But anyway, um, uh, so um, this is exactly, oh, here it is. This is exactly why the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican, the Episcopal Church, and a host of other churches have gone the way of complete apostasy. They ordained those who should never have been considered for ordination, and together they reap what they have sown. Now, obviously, this goes on over a period of time. The older people kick off, and he may have been misleading them while they were alive, but eventually they retire, kick off, and now he's in a position where he can actually do the things that he should never have been given the authority to do. And he steps in and he starts doing it. We've seen it in seminaries since the very beginning. Seminaries start with a good purpose. They start with good teachers who are very well qualified. We have an emergency. We need to have a new Hebrew teacher. He's not a great guy, but he knows Hebrew very well. We got to get him in here because we have to have a Hebrew program, right? Next thing that happens, he's in. And once he's in, they ain't getting rid of him. And he infects the entire seminary and the seminary starts to fall away. This is what happens in the world. Seminary after seminary ends up right in the garbage can, and that's why we have new seminaries starting all the time, is because they, the ones that exist that should have stayed the course did not, and they start to fall away, and pretty soon they're not even Christian entities anymore. So I, it's sad, it's, but it's the way of the world, okay? And it's not at all unexpected by the Lord. He knows these things, he knows who are his, and he is... You know, he, right? All you need to do is read Revelation two and three, right? You've got the seven churches, and then he says, "I'm going to take away your lampstand," right? He knows. He already knows who are his. He knows who are falling away from him. He knows the ultimate end of all of these things, and that includes seminaries. It includes denominations. It, the whole thing is included in there. So, um, instead of following such an unholy course of action, Paul admonishes Timothy to keep yourself. Pure, Paul's words. Okay, keep yourself pure. The decisions Timothy must make include ordaining ministers, deacons, elders, missionaries, and so forth, and carefully evaluating each person, praying over them, testing them according to the guidelines given in the pastoral epistles, and so forth. Timothy would keep himself pure and he would be free from sharing in the sins of others. Okay, we kind of see that it's a little different context because the Bible had not yet been completed. They didn't have the New Testament, but you kind of see this in, I, I want to say it's Acts 13. Give me a second to get here, and, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's Acts 13. Um, the last sentence that I just read from my commentary, what does it say here? Um, well, it would help to be in Acts, not in Luke, okay? Um, there we go. Acts, uh, yeah, here it is, Acts 13.1. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mana, and uh, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, here, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Here it is. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Okay, nowadays it's a little different in the process. The Holy Spirit is not selecting people directly. Even if he is indirectly, he's not selecting people like that. Okay, we have the word of God to tell us how to do these things. 
And so there's no need for the Spirit to intervene through prophets and so forth. The Word is written. The guidelines are given. However, I absolutely am certain of this, is that if the Lord wants someone in, we'll just pick a country, uh, Papua New Guinea. There's an island in Papua New Guinea that has never been evangelized. If the Lord wants somebody there, his spirit is going to move and make that happen. It's going to happen. I don't think it's going to be active the way that it was there. The spirit spoke through these people, set these people apart, and send them out as missionaries. But he will make it happen. This is his world. This is the, the God's world. It is his decision where the word is going to get. And if he doesn't want the word for some reason, he's going to stop it from happening. Okay, that happened again and again to Paul in, um, I think it's Acts 16, where at one time he wants to go into Asia and the Spirit uh, didn't permit him. And then after that, uh, he has a dream. A man from Macedonia is calling, come over to us, come up. And he says, well, that's a sign from the Lord. And where do they go? They go off to Macedonia. And we got the letters of these Macedonian churches, right? They were great and effective. But if he had gone in a different direction, then the world would have been in a completely different state at this point in time. The gospel may never have taken effect the way that it should have. Because once you have the Greek-speaking churches, that's the lingua franca of the Western Empire at the time. And so they start going up into the areas of Europe. They go up into Germany. They go up into the areas all around. And I'm talking over hundreds of years. But eventually you get up into, uh, you know, the people like Tyndale, he translates the Bible into English, and then from there, it gets up into uh, England, and they start having this great renaissance. Catholicism is chased out, then it comes back, then it's chased out, but eventually, Protestantism takes hold, and what happens, they've got uh, the greatest minds in all of Christian history sitting there in dark rooms giving commentaries on the Bible. And then from there, what happened? These people started to move into the Americas. And Christianity went all over the world because of the American churches. It had already started that direction. But if it had gone in the other direction, would it have happened? I would say no, because the Lord didn't allow it to happen. He did not permit them to go in that direction. Instead, it was this direction. And now the whole world, just as Jesus said, is being evangelized. And we've got the Jesus film that's in thousands of languages, 1,300, 1,400 languages, more, I don't know. And uh, what's that? 2,200, he says, and more every day. Um, and, you know, we've got people that are computer literate that have made computers. Uh, this was probably 15 years ago, so the technology is way better now. But um, at the time, they had a guy that was lying down thinking about how to, you know, increase translations uh, and getting the word out to other languages that were similar but not the same. And he developed, laying down in bed, something called adapt it. And what it does is it adapts the languages to the closest language that's out there. And so very quickly, instead of having a 15 to 20 year uh, turnover in a language getting its own Bible, they were able to do it in two to three years, okay? Just because somebody was thinking about it. Now, look at the technology we have. Google just added, within the past month, like, 400 new languages or something. I mean, I, I read it and I, I was going to translate because I needed to translate something for Hidako because she wasn't in the house for her niece in Japan. And, you know, I can type this fast and out comes Japanese. Perfect Japanese. She's never had to, I, ever. Have you? Have you ever needed to correct what I've typed? No, it, it's that fast. And Japanese is a very, very complicated language. It's hugely complicated. And yet I type what I'm thinking. It takes my words right into Japanese. And I send it off to her. And then she comes back 30 seconds later with her Japanese. And it translates into English. And we can talk to each other perfectly. I, I mean, absolutely perfectly about really technical stuff. There's a uh, issue with the family, uh, their home and inheritance and all that, that she's involved in because she's a member of the Shimabuku family. And it was doing all of it. Okay, now imagine that. We can do that with all of these languages. Google adds in more every single day. We've got the Adaptive program, which is probably even more now. What a world we're living in. And when Jesus said that all nations would be evangelized, who would have thought? 
Who would have thought? And here it is. We can do these things in a matter of years or less that used to take 15 or 20 years. If you would kept with the, uh, the uh, you know, the projection that uh, Wycliffe had 15 or 20 years ago, they were like, well, we hope to have the whole world evangelized by whatever. Well, I don't know. We'll just say uh, 35, 13 AD. All right. Now they're down to like 20, 25. I'm kidding. But you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's that quick. So great stuff. And that was all just made up off the top of my head, the date. So just ignore that. But I was giving an example. They had a long projection and now they can have a much shorter one. Um, anyway, here we go. Let's see. But then, of course, you got the people that say that it's not right that Christians evangelize other people. And you got those forces working against you. You know, like that's a terrible thing that you're actually having people live morally. But, well, there you go. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, where was I? The decisions Timothy must make. Uh, yeah, I've already read that. Timothy would keep. Okay, life application. The laying on of hands for ordination does not make a person holy, okay? Rather, it is to be an acknowledgement that the person has lived in a holy manner, okay? And is acceptable to be ordained and set apart for the service to the Lord. Okay, holy. When we think of the word holy, a lot of people think of something like um, glistening maybe or or gold or I you know what I mean there's there, there's this thing that we don't really grasp in our head what is how would you define the most simple way possible the word holy anybody separation separation that's it okay when we think of God he is infinitely holy he is infinitely separated from anything sinful we are sinful therefore he is infinitely holy okay when we say holy, 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 that's the way we identify him as so separate that we don't have the concept of even acknowledging it except with our, our, our failing words. That's holy, okay? Um, you could say, well, we are ordaining you to be holy. That's not what we're doing. The person should already be separate. He should be living already in a way that is separate from the world, okay? So it's acknowledgement of that. It is not a positioning of that person in that, okay? And so that's where we get these wrong ideas. Um, Aaron and his sons were holy to the Lord. That means separate to the Lord. They are no longer like the rest of the congregation. They've been acknowledged as the Lord's priests and now they are being ordained to that position, okay? Um, and so that's the idea of holiness, separation. It is just, you know, and you could have a million different uh, levels of holiness, but holiness simply means there's a separation of some type between two entities, okay? Um, uh, uh, rather, it is to be an acknowledgement that the person has lived in a holy manner and is acceptable to be ordained. In ordaining perverts, greedy people, and any others who are specifically unqualified according to scripture, the church does not gain a good new minister. I talked about that about 15 minutes ago. Instead, it gains a new problem and it heads quickly down Apostasy Avenue and right onto Heresy Highway. It is better to have nobody fill a job in the ministry than to fill that job with a moral minuscule. Okay, as I said, if a seminary doesn't have a Hebrew class, that's too bad. I feel bad for them. It is something that is hugely important. If they were willing to pay more, they might get a, a better qualified person, but they should never compromise in hiring a professor for any job who is not qualified for the entire life that he lives, because he may stay there for his entire life and just cause trouble for that seminary the entire time. He needs to be properly vetted. He needs to already be somebody living properly, and then you accept him as a professor. Same thing as a minister, same thing as a pastor, etc. If not, you're only saying we, we are welcoming trouble into our church. That's all you're going to do. Okay, 23. Stop drinking only water and use little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. What? 
No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Okay, I don't even remember what I said on here, but I could go on all day about this particular verse and several like it. But um, the addition of this verse by Paul brings with it a wonderful note of authenticity concerning the epistle itself. It is a spontaneous thought which would not have been included by someone forging the letter. That is for certain. I, that's right off the bat a given. You wouldn't say something like that if you were forging a letter in Paul's name. Okay, he's saying something that is personal. He is saying something that he is aware of with Timothy. And he's saying it in the middle of a pastoral epistle. Now, who would even think this? But there you go. Um, uh, in other words, for those who claim that this epistle is a later writing by someone who is aware of a more developed hierarchy within the church than which would have been seen at this early stage, they're actually shown to be wrong by verses like this, okay? Paul would never put something like this in here if he was forging a letter or whoever the supposed Paul was. It's just, it's not the kind, it, it doesn't fit the tenor at all. It's Paul being Paul, okay? So, the flow is spontaneous and natural and it demonstrates an affection between Paul and Timothy, which is borne out by other times that they are together in the New Testament when the two are mentioned in connection with one another. Okay, it's just that natural love that Paul had for Timothy, and he's telling him, even in his pastoral ministry, don't worry about this issue. You need to take care of yourself. You need to do what's right. You need to be healthy. You need to be uh, somebody that is uh, ready to, uh, you know, a, a completely different context, completely different approach. But, you know, I, you have to do certain things in order to find yourself prepared for the ministry. And I suppose, like, one time I got my finger almost cut off. I still have a couple of scars here, but I almost whacked it off with a chainsaw. And what do you do? You got to go to the doctor and he's got to sew it up. Now, if something worse happens, you may miss church on Sunday. Okay, that hasn't happened yet, but uh, there are certain things that you need to do to make sure you take care of yourself so that you are capable of being in the ministry and taking care of the people you're supposed to take care of. And so when I had a problem, uh, it's been, what, nine weeks now, maybe eight weeks, I started to have a problem, and I, it was a terrible problem, and I had a couple choices. I could have gone to a doctor. I could have gone, you know, to get cancer tests. I could have gone to get a colonoscopy or who knows what. I could have done 10,000 different things, and we have, of course, Ron here who nags everybody in the church about fasting every 15 minutes. If you ever go up to Ron and start a conversation, you could start a conversation about the latest model of Maserati. And within 30 seconds, he'll be telling you They're why fast. you need to fast. That's right. What? They're fast, aren't they? They're fast. They and see, fast? fasting is something that a Maserati does, but it's also something you can do. He's very good about getting you into, because it's his thing. We all have our thing in the world. Well, he, he talked to Hideko, he's talked to me, he's talked to most of you about fasting. And, you know, more than anything, I just said, I'm going to take his advice because I don't ever want him to bother me again about fasting. And so I said, I'm gonna try this. And so a 21 day fast, and I had no idea what the results would be. And so, and I tried not to tell anybody, although it did kind of get out. I told a couple people and then it got around. Um, but the people that didn't know it, um, I decided I'm going to do this and I'm certainly never going to tell my father because my father would not have, he would have flipped his lid and insisted I go to the doctor. You've got a problem. You need to. Anyway, so um, afterward, I told him that I had fasted. And when I, now that he knows that it worked, he probably thinks it's a great approach. But that's not, you know, he was the son of a doctor. And that's what you did when you needed your health taken care of as you went to the doctor. Okay, so I, after a certain year, which was four years ago, I decided I don't want to trust doctors anymore. And so uh, I fasted. And I'm making a point that this is on the same level as what Paul is telling Timothy, so just so you know, I'm not diverting. Um, and the fast actually seems to have taken care of the problem I had, okay? Uh, I'm not bleeding anymore, which is good. And because uh, when you're bleeding, there's obviously something wrong. And other things, Ron said, you're gonna find other things that you just weren't thinking about. And sure enough, I had just the terrible psoriasis here. It was terrible, constant. 
And so I had to stop using any shampoo with any, uh, you know, scents or anything. It has to be just, it, I realized yesterday that's completely gone. It was always there, even when I gave that, because I'm washing my hands with soap at the, the uh, you know, at the sink, and that has it. And then you scratch yourself and it, it, it that's gone. So there are certain things, there's three or four things that have happened. I'm waiting to see if my toe is, it, toes take a long time because one nail takes what, six months to grow. But I've had a toe that has had, it, it once a year it gets an infection and it falls off and it's terrible. Uh, you know, and it can be really painful too. And the only thing that would take away the pain was um, Vicks Vapor Rub. You ever get a fungus on your toe? Put Vicks on it. Smear it over it. It will be gone in minutes. I'm not kidding. It's great. But it doesn't take care of the underlying problem. So far, I haven't had that. And so that may be another thing. So I can say that fasting works. I can also say that I hated every minute of it. So if you don't want, you know, you got to make your choices in life. But um, there you go, that's it. But that falls in with what Paul is saying to Timothy here about a different issue. So having said it, here we go. Um, the words in the Greek are more purposeful than this translation, meaning the New King James Version. It is more precisely rendered, be no longer a drinker of water. The word only is implied in the thought though. Be no longer a drinker of water only water. It's implied, but it doesn't say it, okay? Paul is giving advice that is meant to correct the very thing that seems to be the cause of Timothy's ailments, okay? Uh, and going back to my fast, the reason why I did that is because I had an ailment. If I don't take care of it, there's going to be a point where I can no longer come to the church. I'm going to have to go to the hospital or something, and I just wanted to take the path of least resistance in that regard. All right, and that's what I did. Um, I will say this, just so everybody's aware of it, because I'm sure somebody's gonna email me about this. I was never hungry through the entire fast. I was ne I never eat on Mondays because it's sermon typing day. And so I said, I'm gonna start on a Monday because then I'm already not eating and it just won't bother me. And when I, at the end of the day, I have dinner, but during the day I don't eat because I want my brain to work. And when you eat, your brain stops it, it starts going to your stomach. They've proven that. If you eat, you are no longer thinking as well as you could. Just drink water, keep your brain. Uh, and she's fasting. That lady can tell you right there about long fasts. So talk to her as well. Um, but she's not a pushy one like Ron. So she'd probably be a be better person to talk to. But um, uh, so I did have two dreams about food. I admit that. It doesn't mean I was hungry, I just dreamt about food. I dreamt about tacos, which I still haven't had, and I dreamt about a uh, uh, Publix meatball sub, which I have had since then. So, um, uh, uh, and those are the only two dreams I had. I never thought, I've, I've got to eat today. I never thought that, but it's very debilitating. So if you want to try fasting for your health, you need to do a full 21 days. Y you have to, because whatever your problem is, that's the minimum. But uh, you're very, very tired. I don't know if you could tell around here, but I was not a happy camper. But it did take care of the problems. So um, uh, I won't say any more about that, but once again, you're having a compare comparison here. Be no longer a drinker of water, okay? Take care of your stomach by fasting. Whatever it is, uh, that's what Paul is saying. Okay, in having too strict of a diet, He's probably doing more harm to himself than good. And we see this all the time. Some people get fixated. I don't know if you ever heard of the guy that went to the islands, like the South Pacific, and he only ate coconuts. And he had a little cult with him, and they only ate coconuts. And people started dying, and it was very unhealthy. He said, this is the miracle food. Trust me, after that guy's example, coconuts will get you so far and no further. Okay, you have to have a balanced diet. You have to eat properly. You can fast properly. You can do all kinds of things. Um, but uh, if you do anything, that, what is the saying that covers every base in this regard? Everything. Moderation is key. She's got it. Everything in moderation. Moderation is key. I don't care what it is you do in this world. I know people that eat only vegetables. I know people that eat only fruit. And there's always something wrong with them. There's a deficiency, whether they will admit it or not. You need to eat certain things and you can restrict things, but everything in moderation. Don't overdo it, anything. That's the idea that's going on right here. 
okay? Um, and having too strict of a diet, he's probably doing more harm than good. To correct this, Paul says, but use a little wine. The degree of lunacy, which is provided by teetotaling scholars concerning this verse, is beyond the pale. Okay, I'm going to admit it. I think he's dead, so it doesn't matter anyway. But uh, Charles Ryrie is a big name in college textbooks. Okay, and he's very good. He's got great doctrine. He, his uh, doctrine on issues is just impeccable until he comes to the idea of drinking. And then he completely goes off the deep end. Like if you have a sip of alcohol in your life, you're going to hell and this kind of crazy thinking. Okay, taking a verse like this and ripping it out of its context and forming a pretext. But Charles Ryrie, other than that issue, was very good in his uh, theology, theology proper, and you know, all, all of the, the textbooks that I saw of his were good, except with this issue. So you can kick that one right out the, the window, okay? But um, some insist without any biblical support at all that this means wine mingled with water. And they write long commentaries about why what Paul says here always indicates that you have wine, but it's mingled uh, one part wine and two parts water. There's nothing in the Bible to say that. It just says drink a little wine, okay? But that's what they, they have to come up and tear apart what Paul is saying because of what is in the psyche of the American uh, uh, person. It permeates American society. Very few other societies, and Sergio, I said this one time, and he did a check on it. I said, nobody else teaches this in the rest of the world. And it's not exactly true. Uh, Sergio uh, went home and he checked it out and he said, everywhere that Baptists have gone, this has become the standard. So there are pockets of people around the world that don't drink alcohol, and that's because Baptists were the ones that evangelized them. Okay, other than that, there's nobody in the world that teaches this doctrine. They all drink alcohol throughout the world, okay? Once again, everything in moderation, moderation. okay? So, um, you do what you want with it, but don't condemn me until you know what the Bible says. That's what I would ask. Read your Bible, do the study. You're going to find out that you are wrong about your particular uh, thinking because it's been drummed into you and you haven't checked it out. So please check it out. But you know, it's it's if, if the only were not put in there, even though it's implied, right? It would be much harder to come to that. Sure. That that wrong conclusion. Well, yeah, you would think because so. It was only water. Like, yeah. Well, that put a little bit of wine in there, but that's also a Catholic thing. I, mean, I know. They, they, they mix the sure they water do. and the wine. And the yeah. Wine. Yeah. Well, yes. anyway, that, that's, everybody's got their own thing in the world, and this, this hamstrings a lot of people. But uh, some go so far as to provide the ratio of water to wine, such as three to one. This is wrong on the surface. Paul had just told Timothy to not drink only water. It would be pointless to drink wine after cutting it down where it was 75% water. The word oinos means wine, just as yain in Hebrew, which is where our word wine comes from, means wine. It means fermented wine, okay? Uh, there are like 15 different words that are translated as wine in the Old Testament. But when you get to yain, which is the most common, it's everywhere, and when somebody, Nehemiah says, we were supplied from the whatever with various wines, he's thinking about fermented wine, okay? All the way through the Bible, Old Testament and New, okay? But it's a different study, and we'll not get too far into that. Uh, the Bible never mentions cutting wine with water, ever, okay? Others say that this is merely grape juice. No, grape juice doesn't lead to inebriation. The word oinos comes from the Hebrew word, here it is, yain. Both indicate fermented drink containing alcohol content. A 15-minute study on this is sufficient to figure that out. The Bible has two specific times in the Old Testament when drinking alcohol was forbidden. Anybody tell me what they are? Two times. That's, these are only two times in the Old Testament that like it is Samson. forbidden. Samson was a... Nazarite. Nazarite. The Nazarite vow. And the second is, Passover. nope, when the priest was performing his duties. When he wasn't performing his duties, he could drink wine all he wanted. But when he performed his duties, and that's right out of Leviticus 10, which tells us that the two sons were probably drinking wine along with presenting the wrong incense, and they gave an inappropriate offering to the Lord, 
Plus, they were not conducting themselves in a holy manner in the presence of the Lord, and he struck them dead. But those are the only two times. And the priestly times are mentioned twice, once in uh, uh, Leviticus, and then I think the other is in Ezekiel. So priests, while performing their duties, were not to drink wine. Um, any other time, there's no restriction at all on the people. Okay, um, let's see here. Um, uh, yes, neither of which, neither of those, Nazarite vow or priests, uh, apply today because the law is annulled in Christ. Rather, and correctly analyzed, Paul is telling Timothy to drink a little wine. He's not saying cut wine with water. He's not saying anything like that. He's saying drink a little wine. He doesn't say how much a little is. Okay, everybody got that one? He does not say how much a little is. What is a little? Is it one drink a, a night? Is it, you know, uh, a sip a week? He doesn't say. It's like the thing about a uh, man should not have long hair. Paul does not say how long. I've had people say that if it's touching your ears, your hair is too long and you're offending God. I've actually had people say that to me. Okay. Uh, it, the Bible doesn't say that. The implication in that passage is that your hair on a man should not what? Resemble a woman. Make you look like a woman. If they can't tell that you're a guy, then you are doing wrong because the hair is the symbol of authority for a woman of her husband over her. Okay. Christ is the head. The man is the head of the woman. The woman has a sign of authority on her head her hair. It's not a bonnet. It's not any of that kind of stuff. Okay. So everything in the proper context and you will avoid the pretext. Paul does not say how long a man's hair should be. Therefore, it doesn't matter because John the Baptist was a Nazarite. He never cut his hair. Thank you. Okay. Why is John the Baptist not violating some principle? Because he probably had a beard as long as his hair. He couldn't look like a woman. Okay. There you go. I mean, everything in the proper context. The Bible has no contradictions. It has misunderstandings. Okay. Well, so, even the saying, everything in moderation. Yeah. What is moderation? What is moderation? Your moderation is going to be way different than my moderation. Some people have a predisposition to alcoholism. Some people have a predisposition towards, uh, you know, uh, pe some people say people are born gay. I personally don't believe that. I believe something happened to them when they were young that caused them to have that predisposition. But it does not mean that person has to act out on his predisposition, especially if God says, don't do it. If somebody has a predisposition for alcohol or drugs or whatever, he just shouldn't do it, okay? I had a preacher one time say one of the wisest things I've ever heard. He said, if you are an alcoholic and you wanna prove that you're not out an alcoholic anymore, don't walk down the wine aisle of the drugstore or the grocery store. That's just nonsense. Why would you do that? You're putting yourself in the temptation. Okay, everything in context and everything with a sense of reason and logic and you'll do fine. Okay, so um, uh, he doesn't tell how much a little is. And other than telling Christians not to be drunk with oinos, meaning wine, in Ephesians 5.18, no amount is set for the believer. None. None. Zero. As a matter of fact, um, oh yeah, yeah, I'm going to say it right here. At one time, Paul even acknowledges that those in the church were drunk. Specifically, they were drunk. They were in the church and they were drunk. And he doesn't rebuke them for it. That's 1 Corinthians 11.21. Instead, he tells them to conduct such affairs at home, not at the Lord's Supper. Because they're not showing respect to the Lord. He said, what, don't you have homes to get drunk in? That's pretty explicit. I mean, the words that he uses say nothing other than what I just said. Don't you have homes to get drunk in? He's telling them, I have no problem with this. This is human nature and this is cultural around the world. This isn't something that Paul just was, you know, making one comment about one group of people in the whole world. This is just his comments, okay? So, um, understanding that abstinence is not biblical and understanding that Paul is admonishing Timothy to not be an ascetic to the point that it actually harms his health, he then explains why he should drink a little wine. Here's his explanation. It is, Paul says, for your stomach's sake, 
and for your infirmities. Now, you could change the word wine to fasting. I know that now. Before I fasted, I would not have believed it. I would not have believed that my body could, one, go through 21 days without food. And I, I think I said this to you. I may not have. I actually had to eat food on the night of the 20th into the 21st day. And the reason why is because we had a hurricane. I worked so hard that I actually uh, had dry heaves twice to the point where I, I, I thought I was going to die. I literally thought I was going to die. And so what did I do? Uh, Pedialyte, right? I think that saved my life. I mean, I, I just, we've got a hurricane and I'm out there trying to save the world on a hot day. No, Sergio, was that the day you came over? I think it was. Okay. No, no, I'm saying when you did that one video and you said, uh, uh, Charlie's been on a fast for 19 days or something during the video. Okay, there you go. I, I, I almost killed myself. And so if you're fasting, you really need to rest. And I never did. I worked every day, 16 hour days. And then when that day came. No, previous, previous. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pre okay. Uh, yeah, the previous video, not the one that just came. Right, right, right. With Helene, not Milton. Yeah, okay. Um, so anyway, um, uh, it, it, once again, fasting, wine, whatever it is. You want to take care of yourself. You want to do what is right in order to not kill yourself in the presence of the Lord. Okay, so um, understanding the abstinence is not biblical. I read that. Uh, Paul says it is for your stomach's sake and for your frequent infirmities. It can be inferred that Paul actually believes Timothy's abstinence from wine is what caused him the stomach troubles that he has. And that is completely to be expected. Why? Because as you went there, remember when you went down to Guatemala? What happened to you when you came back? I remember I was a kid and mom and dad had Guatemala's... I was sick. Yeah, Guatemala's revenge. Why did that happen? I was six... six Six weeks. Well, I, but why did it happen? I don't know. Because you like drank water. bad water. I went to the Philippines yeah, one time. Probably. I went to the Philippines and I had just had uh, my wisdom teeth pulled out. And I went down there and I drank some bad water. And I actually, they had to cut my entire jaw on the inside all the way around and scrape the bone from the uh -huh. infection that got in there. That was the most painful thing I've ever had. Uh -huh. All the way inside all the way around and they had to scrape all of the bone, the infection it got into my face. Um, yeah, it was brutal. Anyway, a little bad water can go a long way. And he's living in, uh, where was he? Ephesus, I believe. The water there probably is not great. I mean, at the time they didn't have modern uh, water treatment. They didn't have any uh, thing that uh, kills the bacteria. And there's a point where people would purposefully drink wine or vinegar or other things to make sure their stomach was properly, what's the word when you kill the bacteria, the bad stuff? Uh, uh, anyway, you get the point. Balanced. Uh, what? Balanced. It's properly balanced. <laughs> Timothy was one of these guys that only drank water. You probably think, you know, you get these water diets now, or that's all I, all day long, all I do is drink water. And that's not healthy. You know, it's not healthy. I can tell you, um, I, I know I've said this during a prophecy update, but there are people that don't watch those here. and. I was in the water business for many, many years, water and wastewater. I love the wastewater side. The water side is very boring. It's almost antiseptic. It would be like working in a, a you know, being a guy that counts the pills at the pharmacy. It's, <laughs> anyway, but um, uh, water has what's called a hunger. And you'll understand this when I give you an example. If you drink only water, just purified water, and then you go to talk to your friend John, you're gonna see color. Well, what is that color? Where did that come from? Because it, it wasn't colored when you drank it. It's stealing minerals from your body. Everybody understand that? And here's, here's the hunger. The Gulf of Mexico has 8.6% solids. I believe that's what it is. It's 8.3%, 8.6%. It's got um, uh, phosphorus and it's got um, uh, it, it, you know all kinds of minerals. So it, what I would do when I was fasting, I'd go twice a day down there and I'd suck all that in and I felt great, great for an hour. Didn't I, Hidako? I, I could jump up, I felt great. And then I'd get tired again. But every time I went down to the Gulf, you would absorb through your skin all of that, those nutrients that are in the salt water, electrolytes and all that. Okay, that's 8.8%. Is water done at 8%? No. Who here has been to the Dead Sea? I know two people in the back have. Uh, there are four more here, five, six, seven. Um, okay, so we got uh, quite a few of us have been to the Dead Sea. What is it 
Rhoda, Sergio, 26%, isn't it? Not the content, the mineral content in the Dead Sea. It's so high, you can lay on top of it. You, you don't sink. You just lay back and you're literally on top of it like you're laying on a board, okay? That means that the water can hold 20... 34%. 34%, so I was wrong. 34% solids. Water is constantly drawing minerals to itself, okay? If Timothy is only drinking water, or if you're on a water fast here in America, and you're drinking either distilled water or uh, purified water, what are you doing to yourself? You're killing yourself. You're killing yourself. You are robbing from your bones the minerals that you need constantly. You're robbing the minerals and the electrolytes that are supposed to keep your body running. Especially when you chug water, you go out and you do your exercise and you chug water, all of the electrolytes in your body are leaving you. Okay, this is what was happening to Timothy. That's what's happening to Timothy. He is killing himself. And Paul knew this. He would, had been around enough. He'd been all of these places where there's bad water. And people would say, you know, if you're going to drink this water, make sure you drink this as well. Drinking just, um, Paul Harvey did a great one on water drinking. Guy was addicted to drinking and he did the whole, you know, the Paul Harvey style, four and a half minutes of, uh, he drank himself to death. And at the very end he said, and his drink was water. Guy drank himself to death because he was not taking care of himself. And this is what Timothy was doing. We can infer this. This isn't, I'm not saying this dogmatically. I'm saying that this is probably what is going on. Timothy was a water guy and he was killing himself and it was causing him internal problems. How do you take care of it? Just drink a little wine, okay? And he doesn't say how much a little is. Um, okay, so uh, it's causing him the stomach trouble he has in order to correct this. He gently recommends that he drink wine in order to, what time, we got 10 minutes, to take care of this issue. The other infirmities, okay, Paul's words are not explained. Take care of your stomach issues and other infirmities. My guess is, being a water guy all these years, my guess is that he had very bad joints. They were painful because he's rotting himself and he probably also would break his bones easily, okay? You're not taking care of yourself when you drink a lot of water, especially if you drink purified water in your house. Oh, I got a water purifier. No, it's great. Let me drink this, okay? People think that's good for them, okay? Or they drink uh, RO water, reverse osmosis. They get everything out of the water. You are literally killing yourself. Every drink you take, you are killing yourself. Trust me on this. When, a wa when water comes through the pipes of America, you've got concrete pipes, you've got steel pipes, you've got all kinds of pipes, okay? If you have steel pipes, you get what are called carbuncles inside of the pipe. Carbuncles are where the steel starts breaking off. It looks bumped. You know what I'm saying? Like if you have metal and you set it out for six months and it'll just look bumpy. That's carbuncle. And they get really big and then eventually they break off and they go through the system and they tumble. Guess what? That's good for you. You're getting iron. You're getting the calcium that was stuck to it. All of that stuff that you think is bad for you is what your body actually needs. And so don't fight it. Okay, um, uh, I grew up on Siesta Key and we had a well and it smelled so bad. She, look at her face. It smelled so bad. Sulfur. Sulfur. We had actually two, I got 10 minutes. We can't do another verse, so I might as well tell you this just so you understand what's going on. Uh, we had one pump that would pump the water up out of the ground and into a, um, we called it an aerator. And then that pump would take that water in the aerator and it would aerate it. And it had sprayers, just like uh, your lawn sprayers, but it stayed within the aerator. Then it would spray it 24 hours a day and it would make all that sulfur and hydro hydrogen sulfide go off into the atmosphere. And so it wasn't as terrible as, you know, if you drank it right out of the ground, but it was still really terrible. No kidding. We would soap ourselves with our water in the bathtub and you wouldn't get any lather at all. Zero. If you wanted a lather, you would go out into the Gulf or the Bay and you'd get a little bit of lather. And that's 8.6% solids. That tells you how bad our water was. But we would um, go to the dentist every year. Never. My brothers and I never had a cavity. Ever. Until one year after they put in the public water. And when they put in the public water, our health went down and our teeth started getting cavities because you're now drinking something that's not out of nature. So when I started my fast, the first two days, I drank that crummy water out of the well. And it was so bad that when I drank normal water, 
I actually, it tasted so sweet, the rest of the fast was great. Okay, so um, uh, there are things you can do to prepare yourself for a fast, but um, don't drink just water. Drink a little wine for your stomach and your frequent infirmities, okay? And that, I'm telling you, that holds true to this day. Don't drink just water, unless you're on a water-only fast. And then what I would recommend is, that if you're gonna be on a water-only fast, Take a 21-day vacation in Sarasota, Florida, and go out in the Gulf at least twice a day. You'll bring in all the nutrients that your body is missing without violating your fast. It's going right through your skin. You're gonna feel so great. You're gonna feel wonderful, okay? If you go four times a day, you'll feel great for four hours a day. All right, just so you know, this isn't disconnected from what Paul is saying. It is intimately connected. Timothy had problems, and the Bible is telling us what those problems are and how to take care of it. Okay, um, he had been around Luke the physician for many years, and he had probably learned to give advice about things like this by watching how Luke handled them. Luke was a physician, he knew what made people sick. Luke, he was a careful physician as well. He would check things out, he says it right at the beginning of Acts, he says it right at the beginning of Luke, here's what I did, I investigated these things. Well, he would have done that with his patients as well. He said, well, you got this problem. You know, does this hurt? Ow! Okay, well, let's find out why this hurts. And he would investigate. And he would understand what caused ow here. Okay, but uh, the blonde girl, did you ever hear about her? The doctor went in and he said, where does it hurt? And she said, well, it hurts everywhere. Well, let me see. She goes, ow! 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 Well, wait a minute. Ow! Ow! And he says, here, give me your finger. He wrapped it up. He says, you've got a broken finger. Okay, there you go. Um, <laughs> I know. Okay, anyway, uh, where is this, uh, whether this is a case or whether it was Paul simply understanding the benefits of wine from having grown up in the Jewish culture, he imparts his note of wisdom to Timothy here in a gentle, caring, and loving manner. Okay, don't drink just water but drink a little wine for your stomach and your other ailments, okay? The Bible is not going to misdirect you. It's not going to lie to you. And if it doesn't say that the wine was cut two to one or three to one, don't read those type of commentaries. It's absolute nonsense, you know? And what, they, what do they do? They'll start pulling out some, some unknown Jewish sage. I've seen this. I've, I won't give the names of them because I respect these scholars. But in order, because they're from Elizabethan uh, England, they're teetotalers, and they don't want to violate that. And so they go to some Jewish sage that says, Jewish people never drink pure wine. They always dilute it like 45 to one, or some stupid thing like that. And they'll cite them and say, see, this, this is the standard. Never mind that I've been in a thousand Jewish homes where they sit there and drink wine all night long, okay? So, um, nonsense, all right? When you take the Bible, take it literally and take it in its proper context. Life application. If someone tells you that the Bible promotes abstinence, ask them, which Bible are you referring to? That's what I would ask you to ask them. Um, I had somebody that was in this church um, for quite a while, and I miss him. He's gone. But when I first mentioned that the Bible doesn't teach abstinence, he brought up Proverbs. In Proverbs, it's the one where it says, you know, he spends the night drinking wine and he goes to bed and he sees demons or whatever. I, I don't remember the exact thing, but you can find it right now. It's where, then it says, you know, you, you're like a man on a ship and you're casting back and forth. And then he wakes up and the first thing he says is, when will I wake up and have another drink? What is he speaking about? Two things. What is first? What, he's speaking about a person that's addicted to wine. It's somebody that just spends his whole life drinking. Okay, which is a person that needs to stop drinking wine altogether. Okay, but secondly, Proverbs is what? D or P? Descriptive. It's descriptive. It's just describing a person. It's not prescribing anything for you. It's giving you general wisdom in life. If you read Solomon's other writings, he talks about drinking wine. So, which is it? This one or this one? Okay, everything in context, everything with the purpose behind the words. But that's the only thing that uh, he had on it, and he said he never drank wine because of that. Well, that's not a good thing, and he heard it in the sermon. Somebody says, you never drink wine. You know, one time I had somebody, um, what is it, Malachi? No, it's, um, I, I can't remember the, uh, it's one of the minor prophets, and it says, um, woe to him who gives strong drink to his neighbor. 
And the pastor stopped right there. <coughs> and I thought, what? And I went real quickly and I found it. And uh, what, what is the second half of the verse? Do you know what it says? Woe to him who gives strong drink to his neighbor so that he can uh, gaze upon his nakedness. In other words, it's like today's date rape pills. He just stopped right in the middle of the verse and he said, woe to you who gives strong drink to his neighbor. Yeah. Where's the context? It ain't in that sermon, okay? So be careful when you listen to people and check out what you hear. And I checked it out immediately. I just went to strong drink in the, uh, on the internet, found it, and it says, woe to him who uh, gives strong drink to his neighbor, found it, and then the second half says, so he can gaze upon its nakedness. Well, I'd say that changes the context a little, a little bit. bit, okay? Okay, we're done. Heavenly Father, what a great word you have given us if we will simply listen to it, if we will apply it to ourselves properly. Lord, help us never to lay hands hastily, but to make sure that a person is godly, that he is Christ-centered, that he will live his life appropriately when he falls away, that he will accept rebuke and to come back without hesitation. Lord, help us to select people like that in our lives and to uh, only uh, want to honor you through the ordination process. And Lord, when it comes to us and our health, help us to make right decisions about our health so that we will remain healthy, so that we can honor you by working for you, doing things for you that are appropriate, living for you rightly, not over drinking, not doing anything that we shouldn't do, but at the same time, understanding context that allows us freedom in Christ to do certain things when it is acceptable. Lord, help us in these things. None of us have all the information. We're all striving to learn more each day, but help us to do that by reading your word, listening to your word, and contemplating this precious word that you have given us. What a great word it is. And it's great because it tells us about Jesus. And that's what we need to know as our wonderful Savior, our glorious Jesus. And so it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let me back it up and you guys can say goodbye to these folks. Oh, I don't think they're going to hear us, but at least they'll see us. So we're going to go break. Oh, okay, hands up. There we go. Love you guys. Have a great weekend. And we'll see you Sunday, we hope. Bye-bye. Au revoir. Au revoir. And, you know, I won't say what my grandfather used to say about... Uh, oh, no, it's hors d'oeuvres, not au revoir. Never mind. He, he, he had something about hors d'oeuvres that... He would always say, and I can't say it, but it, look at the words hors d'oeuvres in English when you read it, and you, you might get what he used to say. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Right. An old profession comes to mind. Uh, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. But the way he said the second one was just like <laughs> horrifying. Every time I 